We begin our brief trip through Brittany at St. Malo, that picturesque city on the English Channel. The walls, which date chiefly from the 16th century, completely surround the old town and are today in a state of perfect preservation. A leisurely circuit around their tops offers interesting glimpses of the town and splendid views of the bay and harbor. The bay is dotted with small fortified islands. One of the islands, called Grand Bay, where Chateaubriand is buried in a simple tomb, becomes part of the mainland at low tide. Saint Malo, by the way, is remarkable for the great height of the tide. In the spring and autumn, it rises and falls almost 50 feet. On the broad white sands at the base of the walls are many brilliantly colored umbrellas and gaily colored tents, where the lucky Maloans and favored visitors relax and bask in the sunshine or enjoy some of the finest bathing on the continent. Many of the children who come to the beach are brought in groups by priests. One's making the most of his outing. Ah, a bathing beauty with the same idea. And what have we here? A salesman? Huh, a first salesman. What optimism on a hot beach. Saint Malo is one of the oldest French seaports, but not always has it been only a port for commercial shipping. In the 17th century, it was also the home of many privateers and corsairs. Claude Ferrer's classic, Thomas the Lambkin, gives us a splendid picture of the city during that period. About 13 miles inland and situated high above the river Reims is Dinan, another old wall town. The most outstanding point of interest is the old castle. This huge oval keep was the residence of Anne of Brittany, whom we recall was twice Queen of France as well as Duchess of Brittany. The castle is now a museum which well merits a visit, not only for the few relics on display, but also for the wonderful architecture of the rooms and halls and for the splendid view from the top. Another castle and the finest structure of its kind in Brittany is the 14th, 15th century castle of the Rohan family at Josselin. It has been in the same family since the year 1400. The present owner, a young man in his early 20s, resides in it. And although one of the wealthiest landowners of France, permits visitors several days a week. Not far from Josselin, in the churchyard at Gay and Nau, is one of Brittany's few remaining ossuaries, and a characteristic old calvary dating from the year 1550. The ossuary, the, the small stone house, was used for the storage of bones. Church is out, and here is an idea. Carry your own chair and be sure of a seat. For the Bretons are a pious people, and everybody goes to church. Most of the women in Brittany still wear head coverings of lace, or little caps of lace and ribbon. These coverings and caps are called coiffes. C-O-I-F-F-E-S, coiffes. And as we travel through the country, we shall see many of them. The picturesque old costumes of the Breton folk are still the everyday dress of a great many of the people and their quaintness adds greatly to our enjoyment of the country. In many of the towns of Brittany are still found narrow winding streets with odd and colorful houses. In Vannes, a town on the inland sea of Morbihan, the cathedral is almost obscured from view by the many surrounding houses. Near the cathedral, built into the corner of a house, are two comical figures. They are known as Van and White. The town crier is still to be heard in many of the smaller cities. He goes through the streets beating a drum and stopping every now and then to read aloud announcements of local interest. Our present crier 
has bad news for someone, for he's advertising a sheriff's sale and auction. We have noticed that the Bretons are a very pious people. Their most picturesque religious ceremony is called a pardon. A pardon is an annual celebration at various churches and shrines when pilgrims come to pay their devotions and present their offerings to local saints. Saint Anne d'Ore is the most famous pilgrim resort in Brittany. The story is told that Saint Anne, mother of the Virgin, appeared to a peasant in the year 1623 and commanded him to build a chapel on the spot where she said one had stood some 900 years before. Two years later, a statue was dug up on the spot indicated. And in 1645, a church and convent were built. A fragment of the statue, which was all but destroyed during the revolution, is preserved in the shrine of St. Anne within the basilica. Close by the church is the spring of St. Anne, where the pilgrims drink and refresh themselves. Brittany possesses the greatest wealth of megalithic monuments in the world, the dolmens and the alignments of Karnak. History tells us nothing about them from where they came or how they were transported and erected. The upright stones are called menir, a name derived from the Breton tongue and meaning a high stone. They range in height from three feet to 40 feet. The alignments of Le Manic consist of 11 rows and extend three quarters of a mile. The dolmen or table stone consists of a flat stone on the tops of a number of upright stones forming a chamber which was probably sepulchral. The allée couverte, or covered way, is a dolmen with an approach. The alignments of Kermario comprise ten rows, three quarters of a mile long. Many theories have been advanced regarding the origin of the alignments. One, that they marked the burial ground of soldiers slain in some great forgotten battle. Another, that they were erected to protect the tents of a Roman army from the wind. Still another, that they were arranged to indicate the direction of sunrise at the solstices and equinox, and to fix the periods for ceremonies of an ancient solar worship. Local tradition is somewhat more romantic. Children, rushing to welcome each car or busload of tourists, offer flowers and recite the legend that the great stones are really hordes of pagan warriors miraculously turned to stone in the act of pursuing St. Cornelius and driving him from Brittany's hospitable shores. The countryside in Brittany it's always very attractive. No matter in which section you may be traveling, you will be charmed with the neatness and cleanliness of the landscape. Farm areas and meadows are generally divided into small fields by what look to us to be hedges, but which are really walls of stone covered with turf. At certain seasons, they are brilliant with wildflowers. At others, they are covered only with bushes and small shrubs. Often as we drive along the roads, the view is entirely shut off by the flowers and shrubs which grow from these unusual fences. The farmhouses are also most picturesque. 
No matter how poor the farmer or peasant may be, his home always presents an attractive picture to the traveler. Mostly the roofs are made of slate or stone, but often a thatched one adds to the quaintness of the scene. Pont Aven, a small village by the sea, is particularly popular with artists, for here many of the men and women continue to wear their old Breton costume. In case you haven't guessed, this is a milk cart. Not bottled, grade A, B or C, but just pure milk. We make our way to Concarno, one of the chief fishing ports of the country, and the favorite Brittany rendezvous of artists. Many of the women, who by the way are noted for their good looks, are employed in sardine tinning. Now with the fishing fleet at sea, they have a chance to catch up on their family duties. Far from Concarno is Pont La Bay, the chief town of one of the most characteristic races of Brittany, the Bigondin. Their name really means the bizarre headdress of the women, and no better name could be given to these people whose headdresses are certainly the most interesting and picturesque in all the country. Nothing, not even hard work at the wash tub, seems to ruffle their dignity or disarrange their tall lace coifs. These women wear a sort of double headdress, for under the tall coif, a small bonnet holds the hair in place. Kind of tough on the clothes, but tougher on the dirt, for whether you believe it or not, it does get the clothes clean. But just how long do you think nice silk under things would last? Never too young to lend a hand. She thinks it's plain now but wait until she's old enough to wear a cloth. You don't mind posing for your close-up? No? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, madame. In many of the Breton villages, the houses are built close together on either side of the road. And a diverting relaxation for the women folk is to gather at the edge of the village, sitting about on low chairs or on the grass beneath the trees, to gossip and to work upon laces for new coifs. The most important sardine fishing port in France is Duarnenay, a delightful little town of whitewashed houses situated on the bay of Duarnenay. It is said there are more than 800 vessels here engaged in fishing, some for sardines, some for tuna and mackerel, and still others which go farther afield for larger and more valuable catches. Every year, Breton seamen sail small ships such as these to Iceland and even across the Atlantic to the Grand Banks of Newfoundland.
Many of the Bretons still wear the wooden shoe called Sabo, a strong, hard shoe for a sturdy, vigorous race. Breton sailors have followed and conquered the sea for centuries, not only as fishermen and merchantmen, but also as corsairs and explorers. It was the Breton, Jacques Cartier, who sailing across the Atlantic in the year 1534, discovered Canada. Today, the Bretons are among the greatest seamen of the globe and are found wherever ships, whether French or foreign, sail. From this sturdy race come the sailors, who make up almost 100% of the crews of the great French liners. In Brittany, at Saint-Nazaire, was built the largest vessel and fastest ocean liner ever constructed, the giant Normandy. It seems fitting that Breton men should have built her and that Breton seamen should sail her. When the fishing fleet goes forth with white sails outlined against the sky, the picture recalls to us the Iceland fishermen Pierre Loti's immortal classic of Brittany's Men of the Sea. Making our way a bit inland from Duanane, we chance upon a wedding in the square of Locronat. 